Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. These blessings are from a list called the Beatitudes, found in the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel, as part of the famous Sermon on the Mount, which begins in this manner, includes the Lord's Prayer, and concludes with a stern warning against false prophets. Understandably, this sermon is one of the most popular sections of the entire Bible. But this sermon was never preached in Aramaic. It was a carefully outlined written composition, penned entirely in Greek by the author of Matthew. And it was based on earlier writings, including the letters of Paul. I'm your host, Jason, and you're listening to Dragons in Genesis. We pick up the works of Paul with Romans chapter 7, where Paul compares Torah law to a marriage. He states in the opening verses that a woman is bound to a living husband. If she strays from him while he is alive, she is an adulteress. Likewise, the Roman congregation is made dead to the law through the body of Christ. This comparison would have worked much better if he had said that the law was dead, and so Torah-observant Christians were free from it, just as a widow was free from her marital status to her dead husband. But I suspect that Paul was trying to avoid offending the Torah-observant audience. Elsewhere in his letters, he does indicate that Christians have no use for the Torah, so he obviously held that opinion. Christ offers salvation from their sins. The old law is of the world of flesh, but Christ is of the Spirit. This progression from lower form of flesh to the higher form of spirit was seen numerous times in Enoch, such as chapter 71, verse 11, when Enoch himself sheds his fleshly body and becomes a pure spirit and is named the Son of Man, or when this ascension is shared with all of the righteous in 1 Enoch, chapter 62, verses 15 to 16. Paul then poses the question, should we regard the law as sinful? Knowledge of the law is how people became aware of sin. He immediately answers this question by saying, no. The commandment is good, but humans are still made of corrupt flesh. The law, in Paul's mind, is a failure because it isn't the gospel of the resurrected Christ, not because it is sinful. And so, the Torah itself is flawed for not including this gospel. I should point out here that when Paul asked the question concerning the law's connection with sin, and then follows up with an introspective paragraph about the meaning of the law, some scholars have suggested that this portion of the chapter, verses 7 to 25, is a later addition to the text and might not have originally been included in the letter. Part of the reasoning behind this idea is how chapter 7 ends with a sort of pessimistic tone, but chapter 8 continues the discussion of the victorious nature of Christian life that was seen earlier in chapter 7. If we were to remove the latter half of chapter 7, the text would flow much better and would lack the interruption of subject and tone. Through Christ's death, we now have the ability to meet the standards set by God in the Torah. We are no longer slaves to sin, since we now have the power to overcome that sin. In chapter 8, verses 7 to 9, we see a reiteration of the idea that those who live according to the flesh are corrupt, and those who live by the Spirit are pure. The corruption of the material world and constant striving to be part of the celestial world are both key features of Zoroastrianism and Enochic theology. See 1 Enoch 69.11. In verses 10-13 to of chapter 8, we see that Paul believes 
that the bodies of the Christians will be resurrected, as he says that the Spirit will raise up their mortal bodies, and they will be alive again. And in the next verses, Paul says that those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Baptized Christians have died with Christ and have risen with Him as well. This inner renewal will manifest in an outer bodily resurrection. This is developed further in verses 18 to 39. We're told that the creation was subjected to corruption but will be purified because the Spirit of God has heard the cries of His children and of the earth. This, the cries of the people and of the earth itself, reaching all the way to heaven and prompting God to purify the world, comes directly from 1 Enoch chapters 9 and 10, when the corruption on earth becomes so great that the earth and the suffering people cry out, and those cries reach all the way to the heavens. In the following chapter, El Elyon gives instructions to his angels to begin purifying the world, and these scenes of purification before the great flood are linked with visions of the future purification expected to occur during the time of Paul in the first century A.D. We then move into a sort of heavenly courtroom scene with the rhetorical question, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? in verse 33. And in verse 34, we read of Christ, He who died and has risen, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. There are parallels of this in Hebrews 7.25, Acts 7.55-56, and 1 John 2.1. Though scholars have suggested this idea originated in the apocryphal book of 1 Maccabees, chapter 15, verses 12 to 15, where Judas Maccabeus relates a similar courtroom vision. But there's another possible origin for this concept. The Son of Man figure in 1 Enoch sits as a judge in chapter 61, verse 8, and chapter 62, verse 3, and people can petition him to intercede on their behalf, chapter 62, verse 9. We then see that the early Christians saw themselves as being persecuted for their religious beliefs. When we read in chapter 8, verse 36, For thy sake we are killed all the day. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. And in verse 38, we are told that nothing shall keep them separated from God, not even the angels or principalities or powers. Two things to unpack here at the end of chapter 8. First is the idea that this group of Jews is being persecuted for their beliefs. The persecution from Rome is still a ways off, so who are their oppressors? The second thing is the idea that angels are preventing Christians from joining up with Christ. Well, I believe these two ideas are connected. In Deuteronomy 32.8, we learned that the nations of the world were ruled by the sons of God, that they were put in power by El Elyon himself. The rulers of this world are divine figures that only appear to be human. The king of a nation is the earthly embodiment of a god. In the case of Israel, that king is the manifestation of Yahweh. But kings weren't always good, and some kings stood against the righteous. Those kings, which were evil angels, would be cast down. See 1 Enoch 46.5 and 62.5. And in 1 Enoch 89, part of a section called the Animal Apocalypse, the nations of the world are ruled by angels that God calls the seventy shepherds, who, in verse 59, Count the destruction of the sheep. And in another apocryphal book, The Ascension of Isaiah, we see that one must pass through a multi layered heaven with gates that are guarded by angels. And in order to safely pass, one must know the password. But the lowest level, the realm of the firmament, 
is ruled not by angels of heaven, but the rulers of this world, the evil demons that control the thrones of the nations, the same rulers of this age that would conspire against Christ to kill him, not knowing of his hidden identity. So here at the end of chapter 8, we see yet another reference to this strange theology, that the righteous are under attack by evil beings that control the world, and are the earthly embodiment of sky demons that they must sneak past in order to ascend to heaven after they die. It is for this reason that some sects of Judaism, including the Qumran sect, memorize names of angels to be used to safely pass the guarded gates at each level of heaven. Moving into chapter 9, we find only two references to Enochic theology, so I'll get those out of the way now. The first comes from verse 24, when we learned that God has also called Gentiles to worship him instead of the traditional view that Yahweh was only concerned with the Jews. This comes not from the Old Testament, but from 1 Enoch 48.4, and will be seen again in Romans chapter 11. The second reference to Enoch in chapter 9 is just two verses later, when we read that Christians shall be called sons of God. See 1 Enoch 69.11. Now that that's done, let's discuss the rest of chapter 9. Paul addresses the debate between salvation through works versus faith. He states that Gentiles attained salvation without the law, but some Jews couldn't attain salvation even with the law. How? Because the Jews sought salvation through works and not through faith, and Zion is a stumbling block placed in their path, a quote of Isaiah 28.16 with a slight alteration. Rather than a cornerstone, Paul calls Zion a stumbling block. This reverses the meaning of the text to support his theology. We've already seen how some sects of Judaism were vehemently opposed to the Second Temple and its leadership. This is another example of that sentiment. In chapter 10, Paul more clearly outlines the path for salvation. In verse 9, he tells his audience that if you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God rose him from the dead, then you shall be saved. Three things to point out in this short statement. First, faith in the risen Lord is the sole requirement for salvation. The personal link with the deity is a key feature of Near Eastern mystery cults. Second, Jesus is said to be Lord the same title used for Yahweh. So at this early date in Christian history, Jesus is understood to be the patron deity of Israel. Third, it was the power of a separate deity, known simply as God, who was responsible for Christ's resurrection. In most ancient myths, the dying and rising God was resurrected through the aid of another deity, usually that deity's father or their consort. Paul then tells us there's no difference between a Jew or a Greek because the Lord has called both, and everyone who calls upon his name shall be saved. See 1 Enoch 22.12. But they won't know to call on the Lord if they haven't heard of him, which is why Christians must spread the gospel. This is the entire purpose of Paul's missionary work— to save as many Gentiles as possible before the day of judgment. And this is why Paul is going to Rome, to gather support for a trip to Spain. Chapter 11 asks the question if God has turned away his people. According to Paul, the answer is no. It was the people who have turned away from God. But there are still faithful men among the Jews. Some have hardened their hearts and have eyes that are blind. They may try to comprehend the message, but they won't understand. We'll see this again in Mark chapter 3. Not all will understand the message of Christ. 
We then see that reiteration of salvation for the Gentiles that we last saw in chapter 9, which came from 1 Enoch 48. So some Jews will be left behind because they do not believe, but some Gentiles will be saved because they do. Faith is important to salvation, not nationality. So again, Paul contradicts the Old Testament. We're then told in verse 30, that all are made in unbelief, so that God may show mercy by bestowing belief and thus bestowing salvation. This is similar to sending the Israelites to Egypt to be slaves at the end of Genesis in order to save them in the book of Exodus. In Romans chapter 12, Paul asked the congregation to be humble. Each of them has been given a different gift, but all are one in Christ. He calls on them to give prophecy and minister and teach and to show mercy and love. To do good works and not evil. To love one another and show honor and be fervent in spirit. To be patient when enduring persecution and insults. To bless those who persecute them instead of cursing them. To give to those in need. This segment from Romans 12 and 13, along with passages like 1 Enoch chapters 103 to 104, will later be used to create the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew chapters 5 through 7. It's especially curious how that sermon ends with an admonishment of those who would corrupt Scripture and become false prophets, considering Enoch chapter 104 does the same. The idea that the world is ruled by divine beings, which we saw earlier in chapter 8, appears again at the beginning of chapter 13, when we're told that the authorities of the world were appointed by God. He tells the congregation not to commit adultery, murder, theft, etc., and says all these commands can be summed up with, Love thy neighbor as thyself, which will later be placed into the mouth of Jesus in Mark 12.31, Matthew 22.39, and Luke 10.27. This, one of the two great commandments later ascribed to Jesus, originally comes from Leviticus 19.18. Paul then tells the congregation that their salvation is closer than they believed. The day of judgment is near, as the night is almost over and the day is at hand. Paul is here indicating that the Christians of his day believed they were living in the final days. They were part of the last generation. We must remember that early Christians weren't concerned with a lasting church because they didn't believe they were living in a lasting world. As we'll see later, Paul didn't even see a point in having children. The world wouldn't be around long enough to see them grow up, so what was the point? And just as the Sermon on the Mount would move on to the topic of judging others, in Matthew chapter 7, this earlier text of Romans addresses the topic in chapter 14. Verse 11 tells the Romans not to judge one another, because, before the Lord, every knee shall bend and every tongue shall confess to God and each tongue will give an account of himself to God. This idea of kneeling and confessing before God is similar to Isaiah 45.23, when Yahweh tells Cyrus that he alone is God, but it also matches quite well with 1 Enoch 63.1. That passage also speaks of the kings and the mighty kneeling in worship before Yahweh and confessing their sins. Though in Enoch... We also have a mention of divine judgment, which isn't present in the Isaiah verse. The rest of the chapter is addressing the bickering among Christians for the act of eating meat. This topic has raised some questions, and recently some parts of this and other portions of the New Testament have been used to make the claim that Jesus and the early Christians held to a vegetarian diet. This claim, like so many claims concerning the Bible and its contents, seems to ignore the context. The chapter isn't about being vegetarian. It's about two different views within Christianity. One group eats meat and sees nothing wrong with the practice, 
while the other group claims the act is unclean and they praise themselves for avoiding the practice. So what's unclean about the meat? In the ancient world, a great deal of meat available in the markets came from temples. An animal would be sacrificed to a god, and since the gods never came down and ate the animals, the meat would then be sold. So if you visited your local meat market in the Mediterranean world, there was a good chance that your mutton had been offered to a deity earlier that day. And since so many Christians lived outside of Israel, the deity in question wasn't likely to be Yahweh. We'll see this topic explored again in more detail in 1 Corinthians 8. Christians were worried that eating pagan meat was sinful, and those who engage in the practice were being judged by those who avoided it. But Paul's view is that such concerns weren't necessary. He states in chapter 14, verse 14, that nothing is unclean in and of itself. But if you judge your brothers for eating something that you claim is unclean, then it is you who are unclean. This view is justified by his view in 1 Corinthians 8 that the pagan gods to which these animals are sacrificed don't actually exist. And if those gods aren't real, then their magic powers can't change the nature of the meat. Therefore, those animals are just like any other. He goes on to state that judging your neighbor for such a practice may seem like you're doing the right thing, but in actuality, your good intentions are leading you to evil. So don't worry about your brother's diet. Christ died for all, not just those who avoid pagan pork. All is clean, and it is evil that offends Yahweh. In chapter 15, Paul informs the reader of his intentions concerning his upcoming visit to Rome. He states that he does not usually preach where others have built a church. He doesn't appreciate when other Christians come into his churches spreading their beliefs and doesn't wish to do that to anyone else. But he needs their support for his upcoming trip to Spain. Rome will be a stopover to gather funds to finance his trip to the West. One curious thing that stands out in this chapter is in verses 15 to 19, where we learn that Paul does not speak of anything unless he learned it from Christ. Again, we see here that Paul's understanding of the gospel of the resurrected Christ comes directly from Christ himself, not from any human source. Paul then goes on to state that he is taking funds donated from Macedonia and Achaia to help the saints in Jerusalem. He hopes this service to them will be appreciated. This shows us two things. First, Paul is the moneymaker of the early church. When Jerusalem needs cash, it's Paul who comes to the rescue. The second thing is it reveals there is still friction between the Christians in the area of Jerusalem and Paul the Apostle. Paul is hopeful that his service may be acceptable to them. He's never been on good terms with the Jerusalem community as they constantly argue with Paul on matters of Torah observance. They strongly disagree with Paul on matters of food and foreskin, and such strong adherence to purity laws views so strong that even a Jew like Paul would find himself criticized for not being Jewish enough, were a defining characteristic of the Qumran community, which was positioned just over a dozen miles east of Jerusalem. Its views and proximity has caused some scholars to suggest that the early Jerusalem Christians were the Essenes who inhabited the western Dead Sea region. Something else of note here is that this entire letter flies in the face of the book of Acts. Paul is planning a missionary trip to Spain and intends to stop by Rome to gather funds and support before heading west. But in the later book of Acts, chapter 21, we read that Paul is a prisoner and is taken to Rome against his will, dragged there in chains. If you read Acts, you'll notice that, like the Gospel of Mark, 
It has more in common with Greek adventure epics like the Odyssey than it does with real world events. The ending of chapter 15 reads like the end of a letter, with Paul stating his plans for the future and how they will involve the church in Rome. We're then treated to a second ending in chapter 16, when he tells how he is sending a deacon ahead of himself, and this deacon should be well received. This entire chapter is problematic because in it, Paul is basically saying hi to dozens of people in the church where the letter is meant to be read, in Rome, where he has never been. How would Paul know all of these people if he's never met any of them? Scholars believe that this was originally part of a letter sent to the Ephesians. Verse 3 of this chapter mentions Priscilla and Aquila, a husband and wife team who were both teachers, in the church of Ephesus, not in Rome. Something else of note are the numerous women mentioned in this chapter. In 1 Corinthians 14.34 and 1 Timothy 2.12, Paul states that women should remain silent in church and cannot teach. There are a couple of problems with these passages. 1 Timothy wasn't written by Paul. It's a forgery. And thus it can't be used to indicate Paul's opinions of women in church. And the passage in 1 Corinthians is likewise an issue, as it directly contradicts Paul's views elsewhere, such as here in Romans chapter 16. The deacon he's sending ahead, whom he says should be well received by the congregation, is a woman named Phoebe. Now, there is a Greek word that means a female deacon, which often indicates a woman who holds the title of deacon but doesn't perform all the same duties as her male counterparts. Professor David Brackey points out in his lectures on the New Testament that Paul does not use this term when referring to Phoebe's title, indicating that she's a full deacon in the Christian community. If Paul was sending Deacon Phoebe ahead to the church in Ephesus, not Rome, to minister to the people, Surely he believes she would, perhaps, open her mouth once or twice. How else could she do her job? And he says to receive her in the manner of the saints. He also says she is a helper of many Christians, himself included, and it has been pointed out that the word used here means sponsor or patron. So this deacon Phoebe may very well be bankrolling Paul. In verse 3, he tells the congregation to greet Priscilla and Aquila, placing Priscilla before her husband, instead of saying Aquila and his wife, or Aquila and Priscilla. And surely these missionaries, both of whom Paul calls fellow workers in Christ, must have used their tongues. And he says they risk their lives for him, not Aquila alone, but both. He also wishes to greet some woman named Mary, who labored much for us. Paul also greets a woman named Junia, who was imprisoned for a time like Paul himself. This name, found in verse 7, is often changed to Junius in many translations and later manuscripts in an attempt to transform it into a masculine name, despite there being no such name in antiquity. The name is Junia feminine. Moreover, Junia is said to be noteworthy among the apostles. Apostles are Christians who spread the gospel of the resurrected Christ, so Junia isn't just one of the apostles, but a noteworthy apostle. Are we to assume that there's a noteworthy apostle who doesn't teach? Then there are Trephosa and Trephina in verse 12, both women who labored much in the Lord. And a woman named Julia is mentioned in verse 15. Why would Paul mention teachers and workers and apostles and deacons if they were all no more than tagalongs for their husbands, some of which don't even have husbands mentioned with them? Their very titles and the fact that later Christians attempted to alter the text in order to change their names to a masculine form 
indicates that these women did indeed hold prominent positions in the early Christian community. It may very well be that the authors of passages like 1 Timothy 2.12 were against the inclusion of such women in their ranks and invented such passages just to justify their later exclusion. So, while their exclusion is certainly a feature of the later Christian community, it isn't a feature of Pauline Christianity. So far in Paul's letter to the Romans, we've seen numerous references to material, which has no place in Torah Judaism, but instead seems to fit more in line with the strange theology of the book of Enoch. In Romans 1.3, there was a reference to spiritual beings inhabiting bodies made of flesh that were manufactured by God in heaven. See 1 Enoch 62.15. Then we see in Romans 1.13 and 9.24 that Jews and Gentiles are both to receive the message of salvation. 1 Enoch 48.4. In verse 18, Paul speaks of God's wrath coming to those who suppress the truth of his scripture. 1 Enoch 104.9. It's then hinted in verse 22 that the Jerusalem temple and high priest are implicated in this corruption. 1 Enoch 97-103. Paul states in Romans 2.6 that the righteous and the wicked are divided in the afterlife. 1 Enoch 22. They shall be held accountable according to verse 12 in the coming day of judgment even for their secret deeds. 1 Enoch 49. Paul tells us the material world is corrupt in Romans 8, 7 through 9, and Christians should turn away from the corrupt flesh and move toward the pure spirit. 1 Enoch 69, 11. The whole of creation cries out in Romans 8, 22, and God responds by offering redemption. 1 Enoch 9 through 10. Paul then gives us a glimpse of the holy court in Romans 8, 31-34, where Jesus may intercede on our behalf, 1 Enoch 61, 8 and 62, 3-9. Romans 8, 36 has Christians counted as sheep for the slaughter, 1 Enoch 89, 59. Romans 9, 26 tells us that the righteous are sons of God, 1 Enoch 69, 11. Romans 9.22 and 11.11 tells that God has offered salvation to both Jews and Gentiles, 1 Enoch 22.12. The blessings for those who are downtrodden but follow the correct theology and keep the proper practices for Christ in Romans 12, along with their later admonishment against judgment, were also found in 1 Enoch 103-104. Romans 13 begins by telling us the world is ruled by divine beings appointed by God, 1 Enoch 89. And finally, in Romans 14, 11 to 12, Paul says every knee shall bend and every tongue confess to God and give account of themselves in order to be judged, 1 Enoch 63, 1. Since we're not counting chapter 16, as it is actually part of a letter written to the Ephesians, Romans is comprised of 15 chapters, and in 15 chapters, we've identified 17 direct references to the type of theology found in 1 Enoch, a book no longer preserved by the vast majority of Christians and deemed unnecessary for the understanding of the New Testament. Why is Paul so obsessed with this apocryphal book? Perhaps even stranger, is what Paul has to say about Jesus. In the first few verses of his letter to the Romans, we're told that the gospel of Jesus was announced beforehand through prophets and scriptures. These messages were given to people by God concerning his son, who is manufactured using the sperm of David. Prophets before the time of Christ were made aware of him and inserted his message into scriptures. And it's through this means and through personal revelation that the message of Christ is known. And this figure, a spirit who is a son of God named Lord, the same title used for Yahweh, inhabited a body made by God from human sperm. 
This is not the Jesus story that will later be told in the Gospels. And when the story of Jesus is later told, his tongue will drip with the words spoken not by a Messiah, but written in letters by an apostle. Throughout the four canonical Gospels, Jesus will repeatedly quote the writings of Paul. That wraps it up for this episode. We'll continue our study of Paul's letters and the possible influence of Enoch on early Christianity in the coming episodes. If you'd like to support the show, there's an Amazon wish list in a pinned post on my Facebook page. The books in that list help with research for future episodes. You can also shop the merchandise from my Zazzle store, which can also be found on that same post. Just visit facebook.com slash dragons of Genesis. If you have any questions regarding mythology in the Bible, send them to me at dragonsandgenesis at gmail.com and I'll answer your questions in a video on my YouTube channel over at youtube.com slash dragonsandgenesispodcast. Don't forget to give a good review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and check out the site at dragonsandgenesis.com for links, episode information, and a list of recommended reading. And as always, thank you for listening.